This video is made possible by Backblaze. You can get a 15 day free trial at backblaze.com forward slash brain food. And in the video today, we're answering a viewer question because Gina A asks us, is the ocean continually getting saltier as salt comes in from the rivers or is there some way that the salt gets moved back out onto land? All right, so most sea salts come from water caused erosion, whereby rivers ultimately carry the dissolved salts to the ocean. Absent a few key processes, the ocean's salinity would continuously increase. However, there are several mechanisms called salt sinks that help remove salt from the oceans at pretty much exactly the same rate as they are added. One major sink is thanks to the evaporation of water. Once the seawater evaporates, the salt concentration increases. So how does that remove salt from the water. Ultimately, the water will become supersaturated in certain places and no longer capable of keeping all the salts dissolved, resulting in the formation of evaporite deposits in the sediments that eventually cement into sedimentary rocks. A second related sink uses the wind to spray seawater back onto the land where the water evaporates, leaving behind salty deposits. Other sinks rely on chemical processes. For example, lava on the ocean floor will react with dissolved salt icons like Mg2+, removing them from the water. In addition, certain clays absorb some salts, for example, Mg2+, and K+. And some hydrogenous minerals like ferrimanganese nodules are also formed by using salts, all resulting in a decrease of ocean salinity. Salinity. Sea life also helps to remove salt from the ocean. Many animals ingest or otherwise extract salts from the water, and this can become incorporated into the organism, such as with a shell from salts like Si4 and Ca2. These ultimately fall to the ocean floor and become part of a layer of sediment there. Similar to evaporite minerals, these are eventually incorporated into sedimentary rocks. Beyond sea salts, fresh water from rivers, melting ice, and the like also supply a steady stream of comparatively fresh water to the oceans, helping to balance out the loss of water via evaporation. Together, these inputs and outputs ultimately keep global ocean salinity in a relative state of equilibrium, though there are always regions of the oceans that are more or less salty depending on a variety of factors. This may all seem somewhat fortuitous, particularly given how important ocean salinity level is to climate, but in fact this equilibrium is in no small part because the rate of salt removal from the ocean is directly related to its concentration. Higher salinity equals higher rates of removal via the aforementioned salt sinks and vice versa. As a result, for at least the past 1.5 billion years or so, the concentration of salts in global seawater has stayed relatively constant at about 3.5%. This, however, has begun to measure change in the last half century, potentially with disastrous long-term consequences if the trend continues. And if you guess that climate change might just have something to do with this, well, congratulations, you get a gold star. Well, actually, you don't, because this isn't a classroom. But good news, you probably don't want one anyway, because you're not a child. At least according to the analytics we get from YouTube, it would indicate that you're a 25 to 34-year-old man living in the United States, most probably California or Texas, and you're watching this on an Android mobile device. Also, chances are you're not subscribed to this channel, which seems rather odd. You should do that and you should hit that notification bell because every YouTuber I, I see tells people to do that. So hit that notification bell. And you know, creepy depth of YouTube analytics aside, seriously though, we don't actually know any specifics about you, except about you, Ben. We know all about you. I do have something better than a gold star for you. And that is Backblaze. Ah, oh, what could possibly be better than backing up data? Well, you know, a whole bunch of things, but the good news is you can do those other things once you've got Backblaze installed on your computer. Backblaze just hangs out in the background of your computer, backing everything up to the cloud. Don't worry, it's all encrypted. Now, I've used Backblaze for years because I just don't really want to hassle with backup, but also the fear and dread of a hard disk failure hangs over me when I don't have backup. It makes me nervous. There's so many videos that would be lost. But right now, my files, they're just quietly being backed up to Backblaze's servers. Now, because of Backblaze, I don't have to worry about this stuff anymore. I just trust that they're taking care of it, and they absolutely are. And if I did experience a hard disk failure, this desk is cheap plastic, but if it was wood, I would touch it. If I did experience a hard disk failure, I could either download all my documents or they would send me out a disk with all of the files. 
And also, when you change any files or anything new to your computer, it automatically starts syncing with Backblaze. And they have unlimited backup, useful for someone like me who has terabytes of videos backed up to their servers. Also, viewers can now get a 15-day trial for free, so you can try it all out. You got nothing to lose. Look, Backblaze, it's unlimited. There's no additional charges or fees, and it's peace of mind. It's just the easiest way to get that peace of mind. So don't put it off. Go check out Backblaze at backblaze.com forward slash brain food or through the link in the description below. And let's get into those bonus facts. The reason ocean salinity is so important to global climate has to do with the currents in the oceans acting as an enormous conveyor belt, moving warm water from the equator and the subtropics to the poles and cooler water from the poles back to the hotter areas in a process that is called thermohaline circulation. Since there is more heat stored in the nine top meters of the ocean than in the Earth's entire atmosphere, this movement of heat and cold helps control climate all over the world. Were it to stop or slow down significantly, dry areas would become drier and wet areas wetter. This would also result in more extreme temperature ranges in different parts of the world, with some places getting hotter and others getting cooler. So what does all of this have to do with ocean salinity? Salts play a key role in keeping this conveyor belt moving, as salt water density is one of the main drivers of underwater currents, in a nutshell helping dense cooled water sink as it gets closer to the poles. However, with melting ice along with higher than normal rainfall currently significantly decreasing ocean salinity around these cooling regions and certain subtropical regions getting even more salty for a variety of reasons, this could potentially negatively impact this conveyor belt. And now for another bonus fact. In 2011, NASA, as well as Argentina's space agency and some people in France and Italy who seem to work for really important agencies, but I have no shot at even pronouncing the things remotely correctly, so I'm just going to skip over them. Well, they launched a satellite called SAC-D. It contains an instrument, Aquarius, used to measure and map global changes in ocean salinity. Among other things, data from Aquarius seems to indicate that a large plume of fresh water can increase the ultimate intensity of hurricanes. Off the coast of South America, where two large rivers, the Amazon and the Orinoco, empty into the Atlantic, at its peak the two rivers create a plume of low salinity water that covers over 380,000 square miles to a depth of just over three feet. Observing Hurricane Katia in 2011, the team learned that the plume apparently prevented Katia from pulling up deep, cold, salty water to the surface, something that is common with hurricanes and another key factor in regulating global climate. Without it, the warmer surface temperature water contributed to a stronger hurricane and helped Katia to ultimately become a Category 4. According to the researchers, 68% of Category 5 hurricanes in the Atlantic at one point crossed this plume, leading them to opine that ocean salinity plays a key role in cooling off and dampening hurricanes. Hurricanes typically die down very quickly after striking land because they need warm water to continue powering themselves. They are, in effect, gigantic heat engines. They are powered by so much heat that they can release 50 to 200 exajoules of heat energy per day. This is about the same amount of energy that would be released by detonating 45,000 nuclear bombs per day of the explosive capacity of Little Boy, which was the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. To put it another way, this is about 200 times more energy than human beings currently have the ability to generate if every electrical power plant on Earth was working at 100% capacity for an entire day. Now for another bonus fact, the US government once tried to develop a way to stop hurricanes from forming or at least to weaken them. The attempt was known as Project Storm Fury, specifically focusing on putting silver iodide in the storms, which would freeze water in the outermost bands of rain, hoping to collapse the inner eye wall and basically stopping the heat engine in its tracks or at least reducing its power. While it seems like it worked a bit at the time, in retrospect it's thought that their efforts had almost no effect. One seeded hurricane, Hurricane Debbie, initially reduced its intensity by about 30%, but quickly recovered and was as powerful as ever, even after a second seeding attempt. It was later discovered that hurricane eye walls cycle, so that 30% drop was probably just a part of the cycle and had little to do with the silver iodide. While they didn't manage to stop another hurricane, in another attempt, a hurricane that would have struck away from a highly populated region after being seeded, shifted course and struck Savannah in Georgia. Needless to say, seeding hurricanes with silver iodide isn't something that anyone does anymore. Numerous other ideas have been proposed to cool the eye, but the simple fact of the matter is that the amount of heat energy being used here is just too much for any known practical solution to possibly work, even considering the billions of dollars that hurricanes do 
every year. More to the point, it would be a bad idea to stop hurricanes, even if we actually could. While tropical storms and hurricanes cause a lot of damage to human settlements, they are actually a critical part of the Earth's atmospheric circulation system, carrying heat energy from the tropics into cooler latitudes, at the same time cooling the upper layers of the ocean over which the storm passes. And not just from using the heat energy, but also from churning the water and mixing the upper warm layers with the water from deeper cool layers of the ocean. They also transport massive amounts of water inland to help relieve drought. Besides the global climate effects, it's thought that if we were able to stop this from happening, the waters around the equator would continue to collect heat, creating even more massive hurricanes, which would be increasingly difficult to stop, possibly even creating a cataclysmic hurricane. And now for another bonus fact. It is theorized by some researchers, such as Professor of Meteorology at MIT, Kerry Emanuel, that such a cataclysmic hurricane may have been what wiped out the dinosaurs. The theory is that an asteroid strike could have heated parts of the ocean as much as 90 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 50 degrees Celsius, over normal temperatures. The extra heat energy would have resulted in super hurricanes, the likes of which had never been seen by humans, with wind speeds of well over 700 miles per hour, that's 1,130 kilometers an hour. It wouldn't just be the wind speeds that would then cause the death of the dinosaurs, but also the fact that this would have allowed water vapor to be carried up into the Earth's stratosphere, causing catastrophic climate change. Even without a super hurricane, it's thought that lesser super hurricanes were the norm even just one to three thousand years ago. This is based on core samples taken deep inland near the Gulf of Mexico, which indicate sand being carried far further inland than hurricanes are able to do today. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, hit that thumbs up. Don't forget to check out Backblaze as well. Why not? You got that 15-day free trial. It's really good. Just follow the link in the description below and check it out. And as always, I'll see you next time.